Hello and welcome to IFI Leeds 2022. This is a truly unique opportunity. A chance to hear from a quartet of distinguished professionals who are at the absolute apex of interior architecture and design. A masterclass from global leaders in the industry. My name's Brian Jordan, and I'm privileged to be your host for this inaugural IFI Leads. IFI, the International Federation of Interior Architects and Designers, is, of course, the preeminent and, in fact, the only organisation to bring together the global interiors communities. We are like the United Nations of the interior architectural and design world. Leads, L-E-A-D-S, stands for Luminary Experts, Architects and Designers Speaker Series. And in this inaugural edition, we have presentations from four extraordinary luminaries. Leading lights offering incredible insights and exclusive expertise. We have contributions from Chi Wing Lo, Patricia Urquiola, Walter Mariotti and David Rockwell. These experts and leaders will be offering us their perspectives on the IFI Leeds 2022 theme, Design and Creativity, Innovating for New World Realities. And now, to welcome you all and to set the scene for what's to come, I'm honoured to introduce IFI CEO, Sashi Khan. Embracing a new world reality, we need critical understanding and modern to today design considerations for all environments supporting our lives. Seeking new opportunities, we know that now, more than ever, we need vision, originality, and adaptability. IFI Leads, the IFI Luminary Expert Architects and Designers Speaker Series, as an annual event, is conceived to learn from our established world leaders who shed light and offer inspiration for design thinking. With this 2022 IFI Leads inauguration, we seek to reconnect with the broadest essence of creativity and its meaning. Our deep thanks to our distinguished speakers and our title sponsor, Shaw Contract, without whom this program would not be possible. We hope you enjoy this series as much as we have enjoyed convening it. Bringing these incredible speakers together is the work of IFI, who would like to express our warmest gratitude to our title sponsor, Shaw Contract. We share their goals and forward-looking, human-centered approach to service and design, giving a smarter impact to all that we and they do. At Shaw Contract, we believe we have a responsibility to each other. and to our habitat, to people and planet. For two decades, this core belief has been at the heart of our products and operations. Sustainability is what unites us. It is our foundation and our purpose. It is the air we breathe and the earth we stand upon. We believe that our similarities are greater than our differences. Everybody counts. People together, planet forever. Now it's time for the first of our luminaries. Walter Mariotti is the epitome of a Renaissance man. He studied philosophy in Siena and Harvard, economics and management at Bocconi in Milan, and his CV runs across a range of roles and disciplines, including university professorships, a journalistic career, and founder of Quid, a boutique of culture economy and strategic consultation. He is the editor-in-chief of Domus, with a task of conceiving directing and developing the Domus system, including magazine, website, 
archive, events and intelligence. His achievements have impressed and inspired many. Always engaging, engrossing and fascinating. Walter Mariotti. I personally think that uh, it's very important to reflect about uh, the word uh, creativity, especially after the pandemic uh, period that we always uh, hope it's going to reach an end. I think it's important because uh, the creativity is the place that uh, nowadays, in our complex time, in front of the fourth capitalism, it's... Uh, acquired uh, what in the past was the place of politics and uh, maybe not only politics. It's evident that uh, uh, the formula and uh, the algorithm that uh, dominate reality until recent time don't work anymore. It's also evident that uh, the major explanation of this uh, changing of reality, it's uh, the digital uh, uh, infrastructure. It's also true that the digital uh, and the advent of the digital world, uh, it's a real revolution for our understanding of reality. But I think that uh, the point is a little more complicated. What happened with the digital and the te technology in our life is that uh, technology is a concept that uh, all the philosophy of the last century indicated as a, a very mm, huge shift uh, in uh, cautions, in uh, the way that we could uh, indicate as theory. Theory is a Greek word that uh, uh, reminds us a time uh, which is uh, eternal. And uh, it's, uh, it was the delegation of people that uh, in ancient times was sent to look at the games. Uh, the games were Olympics, for example. The theory, the delegation, could watch but not participate. And in fact, we encounter this verb, theorein, in the uh, poetic tradition, like Homerus. And uh, this indicates that uh, theorein is the opposite of another, where, another uh, verb which is a uh, skeptomai. Skeptomai, skepticism, it's uh, a kind of uh, different uh, way to look at things. In our times, this uh, philological approach, it's very interesting for me to understand why uh, creativity and design are very important in our times. Because also design is a strange word. Design, which is used uh, all over the world uh, in a very, you know, day-by-day um, -day expressions, it's not so simple word. First, uh, first of all, uh, design, it's a noun and a verb. But uh, uh, this uh, duplicity open up also different dimension of the verb. Uh, design, uh, it's uh, definitely a word coming from Latin. And uh, in this design uh, is uh, inside uh, a secret. Design is not a, a pacific uh, verb. It's not a pacific uh, activity. Design, uh, it's uh, a verb that uh, consider inside a kind of plot, a kind of dangerous intention. And in fact, uh, coming back to the poetic uh, tradition, we can uh, easily affirm that the first design object was uh, the horse of Troy, was the machine that uh, Ulysses and Menelaus realized to make a trick. Design is something that inside has always uh, a dangerous intention but this uh, dangerous intention, it's not a dangerous intention like uh, we can imagine, but is even more powerful. Because uh, realizing object, applying creativity to 
the single moments of our life, it's something which goes beyond the creation of objects. It's uh, inciting and affecting uh, our behavior. So the design is not just choosing a table instead of another table. It's not something related to an aesthetic dimension of the world, but it's something very political. A designer is a person who is able, through creativity and putting together functionality and aesthetic, to change the world, to change the way that we approach the world. And this is more true in our times, where our lives are dominated by design. Since the, the morning when we wake up and go to the bathroom and, uh, you know, uh, brush our teeth and uh, have a, a glass of water and uh, make uh, a shave and, and so on, any moment of our life all over the world are dominated by design, are dominated by objects that give us a different interpretation of our life are dominated by an intention, which is a good intention, but uh, which contains a secret, which is uh, an intention to change our habits, to change our mentality. For that reason, design is so central. And for that reason, uh, an application of design like architecture could be very, very dangerous. So it's very important to be careful about that. When I say that architecture is uh, related to design, I don't want to, to say something very you know, revolutionary. I want just to put your attention to this distinction. Because you know, all these categories that we are historically validated, architecture, urban planning, landscaping, interior design, product design, social design, are very weak. Maybe it's very easy for me to try to give you an example. Maybe this category are very true on the paper, but when you approach things, you see that the borders between these categories are very, very thin very, very unstable. And uh, I could say that depend from the distance from the object. Uh, making architecture nowadays, uh, it's like uh, uh, redefining the relation, not just between uh, the space, the light, the proportion, the materials. This is also part, very important of that. And not, not only even uh, the relation with uh, technology, which big part uh, have rolled in uh, the last uh, 20 years in architecture. In my reading, in my perspective, always depends from the relation, emotional and also physical, that humans have to the world, to the reality. So in this uh, interpretation, we could say that uh, approaching an object, we are doing and dealing with landscaping. And going further, more approaching more, we are looking at urbanism. And even more approaching, we are doing with architecture. And even more approaching, we are doing in design, and even more, and getting closer and closer and closer, but we are doing by project design. So, you know, if you look at the world in this perspective, you see that uh, the definition that we have uh, changed drastically. And also, you understand also why we are now experiencing a huge, deep and silent revolution about the centrality that uh, architecture and design and landscaping and interior design and, I, in a word, creativity has in our life. When uh, um, an architect is assigned to define and to design a square, 
the problem is not just uh, the relation between materials and space, empty and whiteness. The problem is who is uh, the fruiter of this square? Who are the humans who are passing through the square? Which are their beliefs? Which are their taste? Which are their religion? Are they female, male? And how is their relation with the sex gender? How is the, the matter of climate change? And now we see that all these elements are putting at the center of our reflection, but the more of our action, the redefining meaning of creativity. So creativity is not just an aptitude, aesthetical or philosophical. It's something very concrete. It's something very practical. And I would say also political and economical. If you think uh, to, for example, museum, you see how the exhibition of the past masterpiece of the creativity of the past it's something extremely concrete and uh, deeply political because it's an affirmation of uh, identity of the artists that maybe are Italian, but they are shown in, at the Louvre in Paris or at the National Gallery in London or in Washington. And so this is uh, a way to look up creativity, in this case of the past, uh, which plays a role more and more important in our life. And what is going on in our days, uh, it's demonstrating that uh, creativity will be more and more important. Only through creativity, only acknowledge to ourselves in first place and then to the authors the new role that creativity plays in our lives we could uh, try to develop new sensibilities and to set up new ways to change the world in a more human way. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for such a thought-provoking and engaging piece. Chi Wing Lo was born in Hong Kong and has a master's degree in architecture from Harvard University. He is ostensibly an academic, multidisciplinary designer and artist who works globally across spectrums of art, architecture, interiors and furniture. His passion for design, fine craftsmanship and innovative use of materials align with a meticulous attention to detail to create the aim for perfection, perfection in form, craftsmanship and function. This beguiling, quite extraordinary video piece produced by Chi Wing Lo, especially for the IFI in this program, is entitled About Creativity.
Thank you, Chi Wing, for that stunning presentation. Patricia Urquiola specialises in industrial product design, art direction, strategy consulting and architecture. She is multi-award winning, from receiving the Golden Medal for Merits in Art in her home country, Spain, to being named Designer of the Year by many international magazines. A global array of galleries and museums exhibit her work, including the MoMA in New York, the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris, the Triennale Museum in Milan, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Patricia Urquiola. I'm glad and motivated to talk with you at the beginning of a period when me and possibly many of you are humbly revisiting our path. I've been really lucky these years to work on different scales of projects, uh, different cultures and locations, working with people that I like uh, as my enlarged family that includes my team and uh, why not my clients that, became, that become uh, friends very often. It's a multidisciplinary approach. We design products, interiors, uh, architecture, art installations and art direction. We analyze and design physical objects, uh, structures, picture spaces. We design behaviors at the end. You know? uh, we can investigate, uh, thanks to a real conversation with experts in other fields uh, of contemporary culture and research. As example, material labs, digital developers, uh, artists and philosophers, botanists and writers, and so on. We, we try we try to understand and to interpret the, the present and, and the future of living, of working and, and of moving and of traveling and, and hosting. Those are arguments where we move, we, we, we flow through, no? Uh, but how can I relate to, to that user so so similar to me, but at the same time so different, no? I, uh, I can't and I don't want to impose one rigid idealistic vision. My, my goal uh, has always been to offer tools for living, evolving and evoking ideas. I try to observe, smell, to listen uh, as much as I can, to see the future through to my present and contribute to translate it. And, but this many times is not so easy or clear. No? Uh, the beauty, for example, happens not only by choice or strategy, but by the randomness of life too. The fact of starting studying architecture in Spain and then in Italy obliged me to exercise an attitude uh, towards uh, comparison and to expand the vision circle. I'm quite young, that is a good thing. And in Italy, I, I think I discovered product design and the idea of working in a different scale. Uh, there is nothing more simple and beautiful, but even more terrible than a domestic tool. It says more about yourself than any other thing. It can also fill you with wonder or contempt. Creativity in my land uh, is a continuous domestic exercise and domestic is eternal. For me, the, the process, the path, teach you as much as a solution. An arrival many times does not exist in reality, but needs to be declared. You could continue developing it forever, but you could lose the sense of time or the necessity of a future contemporaneity. But the process, uh, the, through its uh, in, infinitive passages, can take you to a dead end or to fantastic discoveries. We are working on, on materials that are not existing yet, but also on, mat on matters and techniques that uh, exist since uh, centuries. For example, like a years ago, we've been uh, designing porcelain from a craft approach with artisans in Kyoto with a tradition of four centuries. And at the same time, same period, we worked with an industrial approach with Rosenthal in Selba, uh, Germany, which has a story of more than a century. 
But also, uh, this year, last year, in the school of Capodimonte in uh, Naples, founded in the 700, we've been doing a research. Uh, the all, these three uh, situations, they all have in common how to transform water and powder into a solid alchemic piece. And in the case of Kyoto, so isolated, it was about uh, how to build a bridge with the present, no? But in the case of Rosenthal, how to teach uh, their machines so exact, you not know, to become craftsmen or making molds produce a more sensitive porcelain. And now in uh, Capodimonte, integrating uh, organic and random materials into porcelain, like uh, moss and lichen uh, and pieces from the woods around the school, which is a fantastic uh, park uh, that surrounds the school, and um, even foam, ropes and other materials obtaining an organic form instead of simply organic inspired shapes. That was what they were doing for, for centuries. And um, it happens sometimes we, that we overturn the point of view. Don't have to, it's not obliged, can happen. And today we try more and more to, to integrate, um, obviously, the waste and leftovers into production to give a new value and upside, uh, increasing always the significance and reducing our footprint. That is uh, obviously is an argument that is crossing my relation with many companies and and in architecture, too, we try to, to follow the, the, the process that, that makes sense for the identity of the place or of the needs of the, the maker that we are working with, obviously. But um, obviously, too, for the user, which now lives in, in a much larger uh, context, uh, not anymore just uh, human-centric. Um, I'm working, for example, with Cassina, an Italian pioneer of, of design, and my job uh, with them is, is being an art director, but also as one of the designers, as an, archi as an architect too. We are changing, for example, the perspective and redesigning the, the, the perspective of the company, the redesigning the factory, uh, the showrooms, working on communication, exhibitions, and creating a Cassina lab for sustainability. And as a studio, sometimes we work on projects that give new life to building on the past, like the Jewel Museum inside the Palladian Basilica in Vicenza, or now, for example, a new conception of residential inside the Palazzo Famiglia Borghese in Rome. Fantastic, incredible building. In Venice, uh, we designed a hotel in uh, the historical Cadidio from the 500. Here we had the honor to, to work on a building by uh, San Sovino. And um, so in Florence, we are working now in Ex Manufactura Tabacchi, uh, which is a building done by Pierluigi Nervi from the 1940. Mm. In other cases, it can happen that we built a contemporary architecture where it was almost impossible, like the Serena Hotel, one of the few new constructions on Lake Como Shores. And uh, that's an example for me where all our research come, comes, came together um, from architecture through product or, or the other way around. In all scales, uh, we, we're working in an organic way from new surfaces, uh, new materials, new objects, to lighting, acoustic, so energy impact, um, landscape, art, uh, di in digital and in physical way. And all these origi originated uh, researches um, in products that they, they they had a longer life even than the product of architecture. And this uh, sometimes happened in the contrary, you know, just with a, with a kind of a way back to this. We work also in other fields, for example, mobility with BMW, uh, or the marine sector with uh, San Lorenzo, uh, collaborating on the new hybrid research, which is very interesting in this moment. They, 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 they need and they believe strongly they have to do a lot of passage. No? We, we are trying to enlarge with the, the vision of, of the way of working with an innovative company like uh, Hayworth, uh, both uh, as architects and as designers. 
And we enjoy the future of hospitality, uh, searching always for new sense of domesticity and mental comfort in boutique hotels and in big chains, working closely with experimental chefs too, like you know, so, so Alain Ducasse, Ferran Adria, Massimo Bottura. Um, and we are surely passionate too in creating and designing installations uh, as the Achille Castiglione Centenary at Triennale Milano, or like a Ferrari exhibition at the London Design Museum. I like to think of design and architecture as a mutual exchange, to keep on rethinking connections in a large sense that goes beyond the user-object relationship. And I always uh, thought that empathy is the compass that uh, guides us through all these projects. Uh, empathy is beautiful because you don't know where it takes you. It goes through well-being and creativity. And in some way, you need to have the, the intuition of the context, uh, the others. And uh, this can only happen when you are truly open to contamination and, and debate. Thank you all for sharing with me this moment. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Some great insights and a superb presentation. David Rockwell founded the Rockwell Group in 1984. The work of his award-winning practice ranges from restaurants, hotels, airport terminals and hospitals to festivals, museum exhibitions and Broadway sets. He has won the National Design Award from the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the AIA New York Chapter President's Award and the Presidential Design Award for his renovation of the Grand Central Terminal, as well as a Tony Award for Theatre Design and two Emmy Awards for Production Design at the Oscars. The Rockwell Group is regularly cited as being one of the most innovative design practices in the world. David Rockwell. Hi, David Rockwell here, founder of the Rockwell Group, and happy to be with you. Such a provocative title, uh, and in terms of looking at the new world realities, I think about my experience as a designer over 35 years, and my interest in design, uh, and it seems to me that what designers do is adopt to new world realities, find ways to take changing conditions of the world, changing needs, and make the world more understandable and more connected. Um, I was lucky enough 35 years ago when I had my first project, which was a restaurant called Sushi Zen in New York City, to be invited into a world I didn't know anything about. So it was a changing reality for me to understand hospitality, understand um, how to, I'd been fascinated as, as a kid from the way design connects people. And so with that first project, we uh, launched a 35 year studio, which now has hundreds of projects all around the world, all quite varied but all in one way or another dealing with how people connect with each other. And I think that is the single defining design element that, um, that characterizes our work. In many ways, I look at the relationship of theater and architecture, and one of the similarities is we extract a story. So there was a distinct story we created for Sushi Zen, which led to many other projects that um, are in hospitality, in transportation, entertainment, uh, healthcare, and in each case, we try to go back to thinking about what the reality is of the group we're dealing with, how it relates to the world, do research and come up with a sort of singular point of view. There's been nothing in my memory that has shifted our perspective as much as the pandemic has. In New York, I sat on 28th Street on March 13th and looked at a city that was thriving and exciting and full of life, discourse, conflict, and it was empty. We got to see what the city is like when it's all hardware and no software, and it was terrifying. And it reinforced 
the importance of the life, the people who animate the city, that that's really what the physicality is built on. As a student of theater and architecture, and in some ways, I would say our studio is the intersection of those two. One of the, there are many things to learn, the importance of an audience, how a space embraces you, the importance of story. One of the other paradoxical things about uh, theater is it doesn't last forever. Theatrical performances, <clears throat> a fixed amount of time. People may spend years getting ready for that two and a half hour moment, and then that moment's gone. And there's a power to ephemeral. And I think as architects, we appreciate doing all the architectural work to get ready for that ephemeral moment, but understand that what we're really doing is setting the conditions for that connection, that ephemeral moment. We got to work with a um, tectonic theater group on a, an amazing project um, that I was just totally fascinated with called The Seven Deadly Sins. They commissioned seven playwrights to write uh, seven 10 minute plays, each one about a different sin, gluttony, greed, um, you know, the rest. Uh, and then each play was staged in a storefront with a seating out on the street. So it was a festival of moving people from storefront to storefront where these performances took place behind the glass, but the seating was on the street, listening to it live on headphones. Uh, it was fascinating to see uh, both the kind of meta performance of people who weren't sitting, but were walking in the street, watching the people, watching uh, the actors. Uh, and it, it was um, one of the first examples of theater coming back to New York. Uh, and we got to work with amazing people and, and collaboration ensemble is the cornerstone of theater. The same is really true in an architectural space. So we, we think that notion of ensemble, whenever we can dive into it, is a kind of master class in theater. It applies to our architecture as well, and The Seven Deadly Sins was certainly an example of that. Another project that harnesses um, the power of empty space is a luminarium. Luminarium is a, a neutral highly engineered box that uses 360 uh, high definition projection, haptic technology in the floor, um, and uh, state of the art interactive um, feedback. And it allows uh, a luminarium to bring you at real scale to places you may never get a chance to go. Some of them you clearly won't. Our next installation is called Space. And it is about walking on the moon. The current or the first installation was called Wild, and it's a, a walk into a safari. And it uses every element you can uh, in this simple box to transform you, instantly take you to other places. Um, so in some ways, it was like the polar opposite to uh, Seven Deadly Sins, which technology couldn't have been simpler. Uh, in this case, it was technology not for technology's sake. And I strongly believe technology, just for technology's sake, is inherently uninteresting. It's interesting if it has a story and a mission. So those are kind of two extremely different examples of storytelling uh, that were both done uh, just post-COVID. About a year and a half ago, um, I was approached about designing the Oscars for the 2021 Oscar ceremony. Um, I'd had a, a long experience with um, the Academy, having done the theater, the Dolby Theater, which opened in 2002 as an architect, and then in 2009 and 2010, uh, doing the production design for the Academy Awards. Um, I had a lot of um, interesting feelings about that ceremony and what it provided for the audience there. and, and um, and I was intrigued because I knew from the beginning that everything would have to be different. They weren't going to do it at the Dolby. Um, it was not going to be thousands and thousands of people. It was going to be maybe 170, maybe 200 people. But the conditions of how to do it were constantly in flux with epidemiologists, officials in Los Angeles, 
who up until the moment of a week before the show were working on um, protocols for making it safe. So we knew it had to be in a different space. And that immediately was the kind of project that got our attention because it meant embracing an existing space. And it's one of the things I feel we're going to start to see in the world as this pandemic starts to go into the distance, I hope, is there'll be a lot of bigger spaces that will need some reinvention. And I think thinking about spaces that can have uh, reinvention that changes, that aren't permanent, something in between pop-up and something that is purposeful, uh, that uses all the great assets of the space, uses the landmark status in this case, but creates a different use. So Union Station uh, was going to be the home for the new Oscars, the main train hall, beautiful space, seen in many movies, uh, was going to be our home. And we had to build within that a theater that didn't touch the walls, floors, or ceiling because of the landmark. So a freestanding um, invitation for 170 people to be part of the ceremony. Um, done very simply, and, and you never know what's going to be the key element that's going to drive the design. But there was something about no lighting in the perimeter that made us think about the table lamps. And almost like a candle at a table, that kind of hearth-like element contained the front lighting for the actors and also became the focus of each table. I've always, I've always been a fan of World's Fairs um, because I think they, they promise visions of the future. They invite many people to speculate on visions of the future. I was lucky enough to go to the World's Fair in New York in 64. Um, so it was, a, it was something I had been interested in, and we had referenced in other projects. We got the chance to work with the Smithsonian on a project called The Futures that um, sits in the Arts and Industry Building in D.C., a building from 1887 that was built looking at World's Fairs and looking towards the future. So um, a little bit like Union Station, it was a chance to work within this extraordinary building and create worlds within worlds. Uh, our role as the designer of the exhibits was to work with the Smithsonian, their multiple curators, that they reached out to artists and scientists and thinkers and inventors and create a way to put all of that information in a way that was hopeful, um, in a way that was easy to access that invited looking at it from every possible angle. Uh, and it really was a, a, an opportunity to be a part of the National Mall on um, a very provocative look at what the future might be. Uh, and the Smithsonian made the decision, um, and this also began pre-pandemic, so you can imagine how much that stalled during that period. Um, but they made the decision that it was not going to be the um, dark uh, Blade Runner version of the future, that it was going to be a kind of hopeful, useful look at what are the optimistic or um, what are the ways to look at the future that involve our own agency. That opened up an opportunity for our lab, the lab at Rockwell Group, to create a series of pieces that take you through all of the installations called beacons. And they are um, haptic, non-touch, and that evolved as part of the conditions of COVID. Um, they're, they're beacons that um, let you know as you interact with them, start to question you about your thoughts about the future your preconceptions about different parts about the future, and as you move through the exhibit, shows you your answers in relation to what people that day were thinking there, what people that week had been thinking there. And I think they do uh, invite you to proactively take a look at what your, what your thoughts are and what other opportunities are that you may not have been thinking about. Futures invites people walking through it to look at a continuously changing world and what their impact might be. And uh, with the long overdue national focus on equity and inclusion, um, it really does invite you to make a stand and see where you stand on um, 
on a whole range of issues and to perhaps envision change um, and to perhaps envision what your part of uh, that conversation could be. So I've talked about um, many uh, issues that we consider in design, and I'm saving what I think is the most significant one for last, and that is empathy. Um, as we got a chance to study our process and put together the book drama, um, which gives us a chance to look in the rearview mirror over the last 35 years, um, empathy or places that connect, connect people um, is really the single driving force in our work. My hope is actually that um, the empathy we like to bring to projects is contagious and that uh, there is a lot more focus on thinking about design in a thoughtful way about what makes us connected and not what makes us different. What encourages participation, not encourages um, kind of giving up on the public realm. Um, I'm hopeful about that, and I think that uh, with every great challenge, there are opportunities that that um, that seem most powerful, and that's the one I'm excited about. Thank you, David. What an inspiring and captivating presentation. We're sure you would agree. We've seen an inspiring, exhilarating, and really quite fabulous quartet of presentations. Thank you to our speakers and everyone involved in this production of this broadcast. Thanks again to our IFI Leeds 2022 title sponsor, Sure Contract. We would like to invite you to share this programme and your own thoughts and comments with your colleagues throughout your networks and across your platforms. By sharing experiences and building a genuine sense of togetherness, IFI and the interior architecture and design community can become ever stronger. Thank you so much for joining us for IFI Leeds 2022. Until next time, goodbye.